Really excited about this next conversation with Tracy Shukart, uh, Energies and Materials Analyst at Hedge Fund Telemetry. Tracy, welcome to Forward Guidance. Well, thank you for having me. Tracy, so the energy markets are kind of going a little bit wild. We've only only five days into the new year, right. and already we have WTI crude surging. Uh, the energy crisis in Europe seems to be relenting a little bit. Meanwhile, like uh, domestic oil stocks in the United States are just just going on fire. Uh, how are you, because we're filming on the the fifth, and this will air on the seventh. What's your sort of near term? How are you making sense of the recent? upside volatility we've had in the energy markets. Well, I think a lot of a lot of it has to do with uh, the geopolitical risk that's going on right now. So we've got about a half a million barrels offline from Libya. We've got another 200K from Nigeria. We've got another 300K from uh, from Ecuador. And now um, we have these riots in Kazakhstan. And um, the oil workers just joined Kazakhstan, and that puts about 1.6 million barrels per day at risk. So I think a lot of this right now is geopolitical risk, even though OPEC went ahead with and, you know, OPEC just had a meeting and went ahead with uh, another 400K BPD um, in uh, in, uh, extra produ- in extra production. That was planned, by the way. Um, but they they went ahead with that. So I think a lot of this is geopolitical risk and a lot of barrels being off the line right now. Mm. And Tracy, can you speak to the importance of energy prices? If energy prices get too high, that can be a drag on economic growth, right? Because if a flight to Los Angeles costs two thousand dollars, I'm probably not going to take it. It does have uh, it does affect growth absolutely, especially if you're talking more you know like emerging markets um, that are non oil producers. Um, obviously, that would really affect them, especially due to the fact a lot of them have loans and uh, dollar denominated loans. At the same time, you know the oil is a little bit. I mean, demand is a little bit inelastic, right? I mean, people still need to heat their homes. People still need to go to work. People still need to um, make stuff, produce stuff. So, you know, a lot of that demand is still a little bit inelastic. Um, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to freeze because, you know, your heating bill is too high, right? Tracy, a very memorable moment will be when the price of oil went negative in April of last year. That was obviously an incredibly you know, bearish sign. It wasn't that the value of the oil itself was negative. It's just that the value of the oil was less than the cost to store it. But ever since then, oil has steadily risen upwards. And I believe shortly after that uh, oil going negative is when you became uh, you became very constructive on the price of oil, thinking that it was going to go higher. Can you just walk us through why you developed that that view? Well, first, I mean the the circumstances surrounding the contract to go negative um, were you know first we had that blowout with Saudi Arabia and Russia, right? They got in a fight and they tore said forget it, we're not in this agreement anymore. And at the very same time. The whole planet shut down for for COVID, right? Um, and then on top of that, you know, it was the front month contract that that went negative. So on top of that, there were two min- there were retail traders in that uh, front month contract, which they should have already been out by then. So um, it really was just a massive combination of everything that could possibly go wrong at the same time went wrong. Um, then after that, you know, I started to get constructive when I saw the next meeting between OPEC and, uh, you know, and the plus members. Um, you know, I think that oil price going negative was a wake up call to everybody. Um, and you immediately saw this change within that relationship. I mean, I think everybody got super scared. Um, and that's when we started to see a much more cohesive relationship between OPEC members and OPEC and the plus members. I I noted that a market difference and after that meeting in June in particular is when I got very constructive because I saw that they were very serious about, you know, getting the, the market, uh, supply in balance or at least you know try try as much as they can because um it was a, you know it was a completely different scenario i mean the world shut down uh, 
you know, demand plummeted. Um, you know, barrels were everywhere. I mean, this was, you know, a black swan situation that, that happened. And so they really had to get serious. And ever since then, we've really seen a difference in this group and this cohesion. And it served them well. Look at oil price now, right? It's even higher than it was uh, back in 2019 at the height. Yeah, so so OPEC is the uh, organization for petroleum exporting countries. So uh, they uh, produce a, a lot of the the oil that the, the world consumes. So and they can they control the supply and therefore the price. So if they decide to put a lot of oil on the market, that will drive down the price. And I actually believe they did that in March 2020. Uh, one of the reasons for why oil went negative. But you're saying that in that meeting after oil is going negative is when they said actually. We need to be careful here. We can't uh, glut the market anymore. We we, we got to hold some stuff back so the price goes up. You're saying that uh, they've been doing that over the past year and a half, and that is a cause of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the low supply and the very tight oil market we've had that has led to oil prices going up. Uh, talk to us about that, sort of who's in OPEC, and then also this alliance between OPEC and OPEC+. Plus. What sort of countries are in OPEC+, Plus that are not in OPEC? Is it, is it Russia? So basically, you have Russia and alliances like Kazakhstan, right? So you have kind of um, Russia plus um, kind of the ex-Soviet states. And then um, you have, and then uh, OPEC is, you know, the biggies are Iran, Iraq, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE. The big players in, in that alliance are Russia and Saudi Arabia, right? So they, they produce the most um, and, the, you know, the, they're basically the swing producers of that group, you know, uh, before uh, the markets, the bottom fell out of the market, the, you know, they were each producing uh, well over 10 million barrels per day. Russia is like like 10.1. However, what is included in their to their total is condensates, um, which is not really you know, it's the lighter, uh, the lighter stuff that's not, it's not really oil. So, but they wanted condensates in there. So it's 10.1 million, but really, you know, over a million of that's just condensate. So they're back under nine. Saudi Arabia is around nine. Um, the next person that comes in under that, in that alliance is um, Iraq at like 3.5 million. So you can see kind of what the difference is and why they are the, the two major players and why it was so important for them to get on the same page, um, you know, after the bottom fell out and after, I mean, literally the whole world stopped, right? So, I mean, th there was, we were st stockpiling oil, it was, you know, at, Floating storage was running out. I mean, they were putting barrels everywhere they possibly could. Um, uh, so, you know, they've done a really good job at they've drained all the excess storage right now in um, on offshore and onshore. And also they're having a capacity problem right now. Their, their spare capacity is not what um, was in, initially thought. Um, right, because they've had the same sort of capex issues as as the United States has, and as globally we have, um, and so you know that's going to lead to tighter and tighter oil markets, where demand at the same time for the world came rushing back. I mean, by the end of 2021, um, BP's latest report said that we were over 100 million barrels, right, and that's literally back up to right where we were, you know, end of two, 2019, you know, at the height of uh, height of use. So, you know, we had demand rushing back and then we had OPEC plus pulling back on the market. We, they were able to drain everything. And that's why we're seeing higher oil prices. And now, even though they're producing less, they're making more. So if you look at their bottom line, they're making a lot more producing less. So I don't really see any reason for them to kind of for that alliance to fall apart again and for them to start producing like crazy, which some people have alluded to may happen as soon as they were starting to make a lot of money. But, you know, I think these guys all realize, you know, they're making a lot of money now, much more than they were making, you know, when it was trading at, you know, $40, $50 a barrel, even before this all happened. Mm, yeah. So, so spare capacity is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's oil that has already been, quote, developed, it's already been drilled, 
but it still needs to be pumped out of the ground. So there's barrels that you have in, in storage. That's one thing. And then you have land that has oil that hasn't been drilled. Spare capacity is kind of in the middle where it's been drilled, but hasn't been, but it can relatively easily be pumped out, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And and then the decision, Tracy, uh, by OPEC, OPEC Plus, as well as Western uh, uh, drillers to cut the supply of oil, that cut, cut production, that kind of implies that they were bearish on demand. And that makes sense. If you if people remember, it's like, oh, people are never going on planes. People are never driving. But actually, we've seen that there's been a pretty robust demand for activities that in, require uh, hydrocarbons, such as driving, such as getting on an airplane. You, you do some great analysis of the data. You've got some great charts. Can you just talk about sort of the economic activities levels that we've seen that have you know defied to the upside the bearish expectations of, of the oil producers, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, airline TSA throughput, people's use of airlines, or it's uh, the, the, the TomTom uh, mobility data, or just people people driving. Uh, just can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, well, okay, airlines have been the laggard, right? Jet fuel use mm. has been the laggard. It's still kind of, I mean, comparatively speaking, it's still lagging, even though we're seeing the numbers pick up, um, you know, pretty, pretty well. I mean, we, you know, end of last year and even the beginning of this year, we're well over 2 million passengers per day, which is um, still a little bit less than 2019. But, you know, that's come up way from, you know, under 500k, um, you know, at, at, at the height of everything. So that that section is still that sector is still a little bit dragging on the market. But what had, you know, what has come back is, you know, uh, mobility, right? Even, um, I mean, even if you look at some somebody like UK, I mean, um, their mobility shot up even though they were on on lockdowns, right? So, like European mobility and came up a lot. US mobility came up a lot. Now, you know, you could argue that's because people stopped taking public transportation, and you know, more people were buying cars, more people, you know, using more gas. Um, that way, you know, we also have, um, you know, supply, supply problems. So, you know, right now there's um, a lot of demand came back for goods and services, right? Goods in particular. Um, and so we've seen a lot of uptick in trucking, right? Especially from the ports uh, because consumers were home spending, money, right? And they got these checks from the government, they were spending money, goods were coming over here. Um, and so, you know, that was kind of a surprise sector. Um, I didn't realize how much, you know, that consumer goods spending would lead to how many deliveries, uh, you know, especially when you add in, um, you know, Amazon exploded, right? Because everybody, there's nothing open. Everybody was ordering from Amazon. Everybody continues to order from Amazon because now they're kind of in the habit of doing that. So um, that sort of sector uh, really you know, blew up, whether it's, you know, rail, trucking, shipping. Um, so all those areas kind of exploded. And then as well as manufacturing. I mean, look, you know, if you look at manufacturing PMI, I mean, we shot up from, you know, uh, I don't know, 30s, 40s to, you know, over 50, over 50 is, um, you know, is showing growth. 50 is kind of considered uh, flat and anything below is obviously re retraction. So, um, you know, we see PMIs all over the world, you know, exploded over 50. So manufacturing came back really fast. Um, shipping came back really fast. And um, we still kind of have the lag laggards in the airline industry, although, you know, that's come back, you know, I would say, you know, 90 percent. So demand has been robust and you're saying for a variety of reasons, supply is not going to, to match that. We talked about OPEC, why they're reluctant to hike production. What about the uh, Western companies? Why, why, why won't they uh, high production? Let's say in, uh, you know, the early two, early 2010s in America, we had the shale boom that ultimately right. led to the shale bust where you had high oil prices and they said, we're going to get as much oil as possible. Tons of banks lent to these companies and it, it ended up very poorly. The, the price of oil crashed in 2014. Right. What, what indicates to you that that won't repeat uh, for the next few years? Well, what, what, there's a couple of things here. First of all, um, companies 
CapEx has been declining for the last seven years, right? And so there's no money going into new projects. You also, investors don't want to see that kind of behavior from oil companies anymore, right? They want to see capital discipline. They want to see debts being paid down. Uh, they want to see dividends, right? And so in order to keep investors, uh, oil companies are going to be a lot more conservative than they used to be. In addition, on top of that, you know, um, during the first like shale boom, right, it was all the banks were in there and then they got burned on the, on the first, like the first crash, right? Then the second time it was like all the, um, all the private equity companies were like, okay, shale, 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 we're investing in shale. So all this money came pouring in again. Then we had the second, the second crash at 2014, 16 crash. So right now, you know, everybody's very hesitant to lend to oil and gas right now. People have gotten burned too many times. And then you have the banks now that, you know, they're very into ESG right now. They all have been talking about um, curbing lending for uh, fossil fuel. You know, that is across the board. That includes nat gas, oil, and coal, right? They're not really into... Um, funding these projects right now. So what you basically have, you have a lack of capex and you have a lack of funding. So we are never going to see, barring any un unforeseen circumstances. You know, at the height of uh, U.S. production, it was 13.9 million barrels a day. We're at about 11.5 now. I don't think we're going to see 13.9 probably ever again. So that sounds pretty bullish for the price of oil. But is it could it be bad for the companies because if they can't secure financing from banks, they they lose a ton of optionality. They might be able they might be forced to sell assets at fire sale prices. Uh, so it sounds like you're constructing on the price of oil. But what what about companies that are sort of shut out from the capital markets because of ESG, which by the way stands for environmental social governance? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, I think what's going to happen and what has been happening actually, you know, and this is not new. This has been happening. Over um, the last few years, if you've seen a ton of mergers and acquisitions and a ton of companies just kind of go away. So, you know, we had a big pool of oil companies that don't exist anymore or merged into uh, other companies. That helps. And sort of those bigger companies, the ones that remain are the ones that their credit was kind of decent. They still can get loans again, or they still have relationships with um, banks or other types of funding that, you know, they're still going to get funding. It's just, um, it's just a little bit harder to get funding for, for new projects. But um, I mean, we've kind of already seen a washout in that industry as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. So it, Seems like you think $80 per barrel oil, $90 barrel oil is not sufficient to really get supply pumping. But there must be at some point at which you think uh, producers will react. You know, $120, $130 barrels of oil, people are going to start start pumping. How do you think that looks if the price of oil continues to go up? You know, and will that increase in supply drive down the price? I mean, you know, I think you're going to have to see well over $100 sustained, right? Not like for a month or two. You're going to have to see that for a few months for companies to really get interested in, um, you know, pumping a lot more and spending a lot more money. Because you also have to think they have, um, you know, it's going to take time even to, to do that. Like say we were at that, that point right now. The problem is, is that um, usually they start with their drilled but uncooked uncompleted wells, which are duck wells, right? Um, but we're blowing through that inventory. So there's already, you know, there's already a lot of catching up to do if they want to start producing a lot more because you have to fill that, fill that inventory again, that drill but uncompleted uh, inventory. Um, and then you have to start producing more. But, you know, I think that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Like I said, I think you'd have to see sustained prices over $100 for uh, at least six months for because that's how long that it really takes to filter into uh, it, to the oil companies. Right. So you need six months or so of sustained high oil prices, well over 100, I think, before they would start getting really interested again. And of course, yes, if they start pumping like crazy again, then um, then the prices come down. <laughs>
Yeah. What does the what do the supply dynamics look like right now? Last monthly report was uh, 11.4 million barrels, and I would venture to guess that we're still exactly there. Um, I there's no way I believe that we're at 11.8 right now, and especially because we're hitting December, where um, you know that's when you get taxed on the barrels that you still have in that you're holding on December 31st. So generally we sort of see production slow down a little bit because oil companies obviously don't want to be taxed on a bunch of inventory. So you think your your long-term view is that the price of oil has to go higher. Uh, What sort of path do you think it will take? Is it going to be a relatively straight and, uh, you know, uh, um, elongated line or are we, is it going to be a pretty choppy way? I think it's, I think it's going to be pretty choppy. I think we're going to, you know, I think it's going to be, you know, pretty volatile. I mean, we pretty much, you know, went pretty much straight up, right? Um, until these last couple of months, and we're starting to see some volatility, some more volatility. But I mean, for um, well over a year, oil price really did go straight up. So I think we're going to see a lot of volatility. I think what we're going to see in the markets is I think we're going to see a lot more geopolitical risk right now. It seems there's a lot of uh, unrest, right? Um, and so I don't think, I think, you know, the last portion of this leg and not, you know, and I, and I think we'll see sustained high oil prices, um, for at least the next four years, but, um, you know, but no, I don't think it's going to be straight, straight up. And, and, uh, Tracy, can you walk us through what's going on in Europe up until very recently, the price of natural gas was extremely elevated, um, why was that the case, and, and to what degree is that derailing economic growth there? And is it is it a real problem? Um, absolutely, it is a real problem, and I don't think that it's even even though we've seen that, that those prices kind of come in a little bit. I definitely don't foresee that problem over. You know, the the major portion of this is just poor energy policy, right? So what Europe is trying to do with their green plan is they're trying to shut down, shut off oil and gas without proper planning and without the technology in place to switch over to, you know, green energy. Um, You know, you can't have, uh, you can't have solar and wind as your base load for a power source because they're intermittent power sources. So you need something like nuclear or nat gas um, to be sort of your base load. And then, you know, when the sun isn't shining and uh, the wind isn't blowing, then you have, you know, your base load power that's consistent. Right. So we don't have the technology yet, the battery technology yet to sort of store that energy. Um, and so, you know, at the same time, they're, they're saying we want to shut off fossil fuels entirely. Like, you know, and you can it's really not possible to do that without the proper technology or, or plans in place. And that's what we sort of saw happen earlier this year is, um, You know, we saw this in the UK and we saw this in Germany where, um, you know, their power prices skyrocketed because they were trying to rely too much on renewable resources. Um, And since then, we've seen them backtrack a little bit. Um, The EU is now talking about adding uh, natural gas and nuclear back into their green plan where initially they had decided to cut it off completely. So I think this obviously scared them a little bit. That said, I don't think this problem is over. I mean, we've seen those prices come in a little bit uh, because the U.S. just sent 46 vessels over to Europe last minute. Again, they improper planning. They should have asked the U.S. Um, earlier this summer. They should have foreseen this coming. I mean, if I could have foreseen this coming, they definitely should have. Um, and then, you know, they also have the Nord Stream 2 problem. Right, which is faced um, a lot of backlash. So Nord Stream Two is there's is a gas pl- pipeline from Russia to um, to Germany, and it was supposed to increase gas flows. Um, however, um, when this first came about, you know the United States was against this. Um, because they didn't think it was a good idea. Um, so they placed a bunch of sanctions, economic sanctions, on the pipeline and the pipeline builders, which created a lot of problems. Germany kind of went, has gone back and forth. The long and short of it is the pipeline is now completed 
and ready to go, but now it's facing um, regulatory um, regulatory problems with the company, how the company is set up within Germany. Um, so even if you know, even if they got approval today, we still wouldn't see gas coming through that pipeline for you know until spring, which is definitely not going to help them in any way, shape, or form. And then they have the other pipeline they have is the Yamal pipeline, and they stopped flows. Your uh, Russia stopped flows to Germany on that, and so I think we're going on day number fourteen <laughs> without flows flows to Germany. Part of that is, you know, Russia says they already gave the amount that Germany asked this this past past year already and fulfilled their orders, and that's why they weren't pumping. Um, but I think I think it's more or less being used as a political tool to kind of get Nord Stream two pushed through, as well as um, as well as the Ukraine uh, situation. Right. It's kind of a power play right now. Yeah. You've got this great chart from one of your re reports of the price of natural gas per euro, uh, euro euros per, per megawatt hour. And they're, they're extremely elevated compared to normal levels. In, in, on the 20th of December last year, it was 382 euros per megawatt hour. What is it normally? So yeah, I mean, so and that's about that's about equal to that was at the height. That's equal to about forty nine dollars if in the U.S. contract equivalent, right? And so normally natural gas is you know in Europe is you know between say five and ten ten U.S. So that's how you know elevated it is. I mean, it's uh, it's a little bit cheaper in the United States, but it's pretty on par generally uh, with with the United States. So it's an increase of five times it's it's like yeah. if the price of oil went from eighty dollars now to four hundred dollars yeah i mean it was it, i was actually at that time it was two hundred and or three hundred and three hundred dollars oil equivalent just imagine i mean u s natural gas is you know trading around um you know let's just say an average of three fifty four dollars right over the last couple of months um Compare that to forty nine dollars, <laughs> just to kind of get an idea how crazy that is. And what do these futures curves look like? Because I imagine when you have a, a spot price, a current price of a commodity at something that objectively is kind of a ridiculous level, typically the market says, "Oh, this is not going to last forever. Uh, it will come down." You sort of see that with the market with inflation. Not that inflation is a commodity, but uh, do, like what's the market pricing that? European natural gas will be in six months or, or a year? Is it substantially lower than what it is now? No, actually, the curve is still in backwardation. So if you go look at those contracts, they're pricing in the fact that uh, natural gas will continue to be elevated into well into next year. Um, so at least a year or and almost two out, right? Cause what, sorry, wouldn't that be contango? You're the the back end the very back end so you're you're going to be long natural gas if you're on the back end thinking that prices are going to go higher okay okay but in terms of six months from now to six months that's in that's in contango okay yes okay okay wow really so that's what, that's what the market says now but again with curves you know a million things could change that, that, you know, if they turned on, you know, we'll have to see. I want to, I think I'll be interested to see when Nord Stream 2, if, when Nord Stream 2 uh, gas starts flowing, you know, that whole curve could obviously completely change. Yeah. And I'm curious if the price of natural gas is so elevated now and might continue to be elevated, how come the stocks of natural gas producers and suppliers in Russia, for example, how come you know they haven't gone up two or three times? They, have, you know, I mean, they, they they're doing they're doing okay if you look at like gas problem and things like that. But they have a lot of other issues um, going on right now. Um, you know, just aside from that, I mean, if you look at uh, natural gas, U.S. natural gas producers, and I think you know, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of opportunity there by 2022. Um, the U.S. is going to be the largest, have the largest distribution uh, capacity of any country in the world. Um, 
should be done by the, the end of this year. So, you know, if you look at companies, you know, in particular that are um, just solely nat gas producers in the U.S. and also distribute, right, that have their own distribution capacity, something like Chenier, for example, um, I think they're going to do do extremely well, especially when you look at the price of U.S. nat gas, comparatively speaking, um, even with the cost of transportation, um, it's still cheaper, right? Um, and in Russia, I, I do like oil and gas producers in Russia over the long term, over the long haul. So, you know, I'm looking, um, you know, five to 10 years out because they are not going to give in to this ESG, right? And as, you know, the, as the other majors in the West kind of uh, start moving towards, um, you know, green technology, you're not going to have, you know, Russia, you're not going to find that problem in Russia. In other words, um, I, I don't know how a nice way to say they don't really care. Right? Um, so I think, oh, you know, as an investment, I think longer term, um, I think those stocks will perform extremely well because I don't see demand going down anytime soon over the next 10 years. Um, you know, and during winter, Russia, you know, it, it's so cold in Russia, actually trying to produce is, is very difficult as well, just because it's weather related. Wow, that's pretty cold. So cold, you can't drill. That's pretty cold. That's it's very cold. Right. And, they, and you know, they have a problem with yeah. flows, too, because it's so cold. Because um, when you know, you have to think about a lot of their assets are in Siberia and in the Arctic. So it's cold. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to ask you, is so um, coal companies, coal stocks, uh, loans to coal companies, bonds, all sort of coal assets, if you will, have performed abysmally over the past 15 years. I actually think there was an ETF, KOL, that was delisted because it, it yep. was, you know, did so badly. Uh, why do you think, that, you know, there, there perhaps are some people who say, I think that what happened to coal over the past 15 years is going to happen to oil for the next 15 years. Why, if you disagree, do you disagree, do you disagree? And if so, why? I do disagree because, um, you know, I think, again, you're not going to have renewable technology there yet, right? You're just not going to have it to, to replace oil. Eventually, I'm not saying that couldn't happen, but I'm saying over the next 10 years, if you're going to pick something for the next 10 years and you only want one fossil fuel, right, I would look towards natural gas because that's by far easily the best transition fuel that you have out there, especially for emerging markets that can't afford, you know, solar and wind, they're very expensive um, to, you know, produce solar panels and to produce uh, wind, uh, wind turbines, right? And they take up a lot of room. Natural gas is cheap and abundant. Um, so, you know, it's a perfect transition fuel for, say, African nations, for other emerging markets in um, Central and uh, South America. And so, um, you know, if I were to look, you know, if you had to pin me down and say pick one fossil fuel, I would say, you know, I think natural gas is um, going to play an ex extremely important role um, more over the, the next 10 years. Although, you know, I do love oil as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So would you would you say you're someone who thinks that people who think electrification is going to happen rapidly over the next 10 years so that the world by 2030, 2035 is effectively carbon neutral? Would you say you're someone who thinks that that vision is correct? It's just delayed. It will happen in 2045, 2050. Or are you someone who says, no, I, I don't think this will ha really happen at all you know, anytime soon? I think that it could happen in some of the Western uh, Western world, you know, in Europe, but um, over the next 10 years, no, I mean, I, I don't, maybe in the next 50 years, it's possible. I mean, because you have to think in, in, in the Western world, Europe and the United States or Europe and North America, I should say, you know, pretty much all of our power grids are aging power grids, right? And so really what we need to do is you, you can't keep building onto a power grid um, you know, I, I kind of, 
it's kind of like trying to build new code over old code and then expecting your website to work perfectly, right? So really what needs to happen is we need to completely revamp our and you know our entire power grid. I mean, there's with our power grid the way that it is, at least in the United States or in um or in Europe, for example, um, you couldn't even if you could wanted to snap your fingers, I mean, even by 2025, 2030, um, it's just not possible that the power grids would be overloaded. So that means that companies are going to, or countries are going to have to go in and really spend the money to do that, which is trillions and trillions of dollars. It'll be public, not private sector, public sector. Right. P public sector. Yeah, yeah. So this is public sector funds um, that you're going to have to go and literally revamp all of these power grids and governments don't want to spend that right now. And it's not, you know, I mean, I, I don't even think that it would even pass. Right. I mean, I don't think you could get that through Congress right now if you wanted to. Um, so you have that problem. And even, you know, even Norway just recently, just yesterday or today, um, you know, actually said their grid was getting overloaded. And um, they needed to pull back a little bit on, you know, because they, you know, if you look at their um, EV vehicle use, right, they're probably the number one country as far as you know, the Western world is concerned on how far advanced and how many EVs they actually have on the road. Um, but right now they're having a power problem <laughs> because of all the electrical vehicles and, you know, are now reconsidering um, part of, you know, kind of going back to, um, you know, oil and gas, which they have a lot of. <laughs> so even though you have your, your doubts about the electrification story, I gather you you're still are constructive on a lot of so-called green metals that are required for the electrification of, of you know, carbon zero uh, of technology like lithium and copper. Can you share your perspective on that and sort of how it fits with it within your framework? I mean, I think that right now there is a big push for, I mean, everybody, uh, everybody and their mother right now is going, you know, trying to build a uh, battery company, <laughs> right? So you have, you know, even all of the, that includes all of the traditional ICE vehicle manufacturers, right? And so um, you're going to need uh, a lot of lithium. You're going to need a lot of copper. I mean, if you look, for example, a regular ICE vehicle, for example, um, takes, you know, 18 to 49 pounds of copper that goes into one vehicle. Um, a EV vehicle is 182 pounds, and that's not including the battery, right? So there is, um, because it's all electrified and copper is obviously a, a very good conduit for electricity. So, you know, we're going to need a, a lot of copper. And if you look at sort of these base metals and a lot of these metals that, you know, are in are in these batteries, I mean, that CapEx in that industry as well um, has been depressed over the last uh, seven years, just like oil has, right? Mining hasn't been really popular either because it's dirty. Now, all of a sudden, they don't really, care, nobody cares that it's dirty and energy intensive. Um, they just want metals for batteries. So I think that's what's, what uh, you're going to find. And I think there was a study, basically, the, the largest lithium uh, mine in the world is in Australia. And for the, if to be, for, to get to the 2030 goals, we need 20 of those fields, which don't exist today. So, um, so I am very constructive on, uh, on those, uh, on the material side. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, the, the lithium world is interesting. It's the, most of the lithium companies, I believe they, they, they're way more correlated to Tesla than they are to ExxonMobil, you know, so yeah. they're not, they're not typically thought of as a commodities thing. They're thought of as an EV play. Oh, definitely. And Tracy, how are you thinking about carbon credits? Definitely. So I'm very constructive on carbon credits. Actually, um, we got long last year in January, um, 2020, January, 2020. Um, so I think yeah. they're going to pay, uh, you know, the, and we saw, you know, huge squeeze uh, this year, which, you know, that sort of has come back down some. But I think, you know, I think that was good that we had a little bit of a reprieve in that market since, you know, it did shoot up, you know, uh, 
very quickly over over a year. But as far as 2022 is concerned, um, what happened is during um, the or the EU has decided that they want to they're going to crack down on companies. I'm trying to make them more transparent, which a lot of companies were double counting. And that means if they're going to start cracking down on these companies, companies are going to have to buy even more carbon credits because before they were kind of fudging it a little bit. So, you know, I'm very bullish that market too um, going into um, this next year. And, uh, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's nice that it had a pullback because I think, you know, it gives opportunity to get back into that market or, or enter that market for the first time if you're not in that market. So it sounds like there are a lot of commodities that you think are going to go up. You're very constructive, very bullish on. Can you sort of wrap those, uh, you know, in a bow? Like, uh, I know there are different sort of, sort of specific reasons why you're bullish on copper versus why you're bullish on oil. But is there a reason why you're just sort of long commodities generally? And specifically, why do you think maybe the next decade will be good for commodities excuse me, in a way that the previous decade was quite bad for commodities. Right. Well, so the last decade, you know, we saw a, a huge growth in tech, right? Uh, I mean, just a massive growth in tech and commodities kind of fell through the way, through the wayside, right? And so if you kind of look at the commodity markets to the, to the tech markets, we've kind of hit a trowel, right? We're kind of at, at a low if you, you know, charted this. Um, and so, you know, and I think... With this new green push, um, with the demand there, with a growing population, you know, I think we're going to hit sort of a commodity super cycle again, right? And I think, you know, we'll probably see tech get get hit a little bit as I think people are going to move into uh, value, um, you know, versus growth. I've heard this uh, uh, thesis on the commodity super cycle. It's It can be very convincing, but... You know, in, in the world of investing, it, it's, it can be important not to become wedded to a, to a narrative. Is there anything that w would happen that you'd see it in the market that would actually that would make you question the commodity super cycle narrative and say, actually, I don't think this is going to play out. I think the next 10 decades is going to look a lot. Next decade is going to look a lot like the previous one in terms of technology radically outperforming commodity producers. I think we would have to see uh, radical change um, in um, monetary policy, I would think we would have to see a radical change in, um, say, the Paris Accord agreements. Um, we'd have to completely drop that, right? Because we're in the middle of a of a huge, or a, trying to be a huge um, change, which is all very, very uh, commodity intensive. So that plan would have to completely unravel, right? And then we'd have to see, you know, some different kinds of uh, monetary policy from the Fed. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, if they started hiking rates, you know, like crazy, um, you know, that might change things. But, um, you know, I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. I'm kind of in the camp that it's a one and done um, again. <laughs> Um, just because I don't think that the markets could basically handle that, you know, I think that uh, you would, I think that it would crash the market, <laughs> uh, honestly, um, and that would take everything down with it. So, you know, that if that changed and they really, you know, decided to aggressively raise rates and the market tanked, obviously everything is going with it again. And then just to reiterate, you, I'd have to see a total change in um, sort of the ESG um, Paris Accord uh, plan, which for me doesn't look like that's really going to unravel at any time. They seem pretty dedicated to this um, initiative. Mm. And Tracy, when, when you wake up in the morning, you, you first sit down, had your first cup of coffee, and you're looking at all the different data points of the energy market, the commodity market, I gather a lot of things you're seeing, you're seeing tight spreads, you're seeing low production numbers, you're seeing uh, stable demand. You see, what sort of uh, signals would you see that would be the opposite that would say, hey, actually, I had this bullish view in energy, I was right, but now it may be time to change it because the, the, the facts on the ground are changing. And when the facts change, I change my views. Yeah, absolutely. And that happens all the time, right? So if we saw a huge uptick in production globally, 
right? That that would change my mind. Um, obviously, if we saw, um, you know, if we saw electrification much quicker than I thought, and we started seeing demand numbers plummet, obviously, that would change my uh, my position. What's very interesting is, you know, we're kind of in this like rolling lockdown phase, right? Where, you know, the whole world's not shut down, but we're seeing, you know, several European countries, we're seeing several, you know, which I ca call kind of like a rolling lockdown, like everybody's kind of on and off for the last six months, depending on what, what country you're from. But the interesting thing is, is that demand numbers really haven't shifted. And you're still seeing, even though cu countries are on lockdown, it's not the same kind of lockdown. And so we're not really seeing mobility numbers change very much. And, you know, Europe's a perfect example of this right now, obviously, because, um, you know, there's so many countries on um, some kind or a, another lockdown. And Tracy, how do you think that a you know, sustained elevated uh, pr pricing of energy will impact emerging markets. A lot of people think that uh, high energy prices is good for emerging markets. It typically is true that when energy prices are high, emerging markets sometimes do well, but that's because economic growth is high. But if it's primarily due to the supply things issues that you're talking about, it could be very bad because I know China, big importer of energy, India, big porter, porter of energy. And those are, I, I think, uh, you know, well, well, China's number one and India's maybe number three or four in the emerging markets index. So how do, how are you thinking that, uh, you know, these high energy prices could affect emerging markets? Um, well, you know, I mean, obviously that it could put a damper on uh, on these markets. If we're using China and India, for example, I mean, I think we're going to see high growth from India, regardless, even if we have. Um, high energy, uh, high oil and gas prices, because they also are very reliant on coal, which is not that expensive, right? And you also have China that has the same problem. So these, co these countries, you know, are not, you know, they are looking for, you know, they do have their hands in renewables and things, but they don't have such the big push that, um, the rest of the nations do so they're kind of flexible on their fossil fuel use so they say oil prices are high but natural gas prices are low they'll go with that or you know they have no problem using coal right um so i i think they're a little bit more flexible if we're talking about these two nations in particular um if we're talking about other nations obviously if you know if they're not seeing growth and you have high energy prices, then obviously you're going to have a problem. And if you started seeing that, that you might want to start shorting emerging markets. I know a big feature of, over the past year has been oil. The oil futures curve was in backwardation, meaning the current spot price is much more expensive than the futures price. And though that can initially quote seem quote bearish because people the market is forecasting lower prices, it actually is a, a pretty bullish sign because people the demand is being pulled forward because people need the oil now. What are you seeing? I know maybe in December the curve was uh, going from you know very high levels of backwardation to slightly less levels of backwardation. What are you seeing in the curve now? Yeah, I mean, we sort of flattened out when we took that big dip to about $62, right, off, the, off of the highs. You know, we saw the curve flatten out a little bit. But what was interesting is that um, we started seeing um, the back end come up a little bit, right? So that means for hedge funds, producers were taking that opportunity to buy in the back end, believing that, you know, prices were going to remain high, right? So, and you get paid on the roll. So you buy low and as you hold that contract, it increases in value. So we're back up at around $78. That curve has steepened a little bit, but you know, that kind of was your tell that people were still interested in this market and thinking that oil prices were gonna go higher because they basically took the opportunity to buy the dip. What else in terms of the technicals are you seeing in the oil market that that's interesting now? You know, you, we have the long term view that viewers will now be familiar with, but your your you know one to three to six month outlook is there anything that stands out to you? I think you know you're probably going to see a little bit of consolidation. I know we bounced pretty hard off that sixty two area at seventy eight. You know, again, you know, I think um, the market's probably gotten a little bit ahead of itself 
<laughs> on this bounce, right? Again, but that was exacerbated by this being exacerbated by, you know, geopolitical things and outages right now. So it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if over the next couple months or so, um, we kind of pulled back a little bit and or traded sideways until we kind of are out of that. And then seasonally, generally we see like end of February, beginning of March is when um, the seasonality kicks in again, right? And we see oil markets pretty much go higher into spring as we see, you know, demand come back and um, into summer, uh, where then summer kind of tends to flatten out a little bit. Um, so, you know, it, again, it wouldn't surprise me if we, we pulled back here a little bit and consolidated a little bit, but, you know, I wouldn't see that as something to, to worry about. Because really what we're going to see with these cases exploding is we're really not, we're going to see, well, the United States, because the United States has the most accurate reporting. Um, so I think in, in two weeks, not this coming up week, but the next week, now that we've surpassed over like a million cases a day, um, and those people are supposed to isolate for five days, which is going to put a, you know, potential crimp in, you know, gasoline demand. Um, so, you know, I would be looking at not this week's numbers, but the week after's numbers, um, kind of as your tell there how much this is really going to affect the market now that we're beyond the holidays and um, all of that. Tracy, what would you say is the most common mistake that beginners uh, make when they are trading the energy markets, either with trading the futures or trading the, the underlying stocks? What are some, some, you know, some things that you've seen time and time again that Beginners do, but you really shouldn't do if, if you're an expert and you're trying to consistently make money. Well, I mean, I think, well, it depends on what kind of tr uh, trader you are, right? And so I think that's different for everybody, whether you're like a scalper or you're a swing trader or, um, you know, or you're a position trader. Um, you know, with the oil market, you, I would say you have to realize, especially if you're trading the futures, the market is very whippy, right? So, um you kind of have to be careful on, you know, um, the market could easily get away from you very quickly. So, um, you know, you kind of want to know, at least have a mental stop or um, an idea where you want stopped out because, you know, I, it, it, oil can move, you know, has has moved, can move five, seven bucks on a day <laughs> before. So um, I think that you have to be really careful when you're when you're kind of uh, trading that that the futures markets. If you're trading, you know, uh, underlying equities, I mean, uh, I would say, you know, I, I mean, my biggest thing is I start with a, my, a thesis, a macro thesis, right? And then I do my due diligence in, um, in the company. So I think, you know, um, I think don't forget to do the macro research behind your trade, rather than just looking at the chart and saying, I think it looks bullish. Right. If you're, you know, looking for um, or looking to hold it for any length of time. Um, Tracy, got another question for you. What would it take for you to become a bull on the solar uh, uh, industry? <laughs> I, I gather you're not you're somewhat bearish on it now. What would it take for you to, to yeah, become a bull? I, uh, you, I, I can't. I can't, I just can't get bullish. <laughs> I, can just, I can't get bullish. First of all, all the mining that takes place uh, that's, you know, involved in solar plant, solar panels are all very energy intensive. They're all very expensive. It's getting more expensive. Supply chain problems are getting very expensive. I mean, I suppose if you could make a solar, you know, um, make a solar, if solar panels were kind of, companies were more localized, right? Um, that could get interesting to me. Um, but in general, you know, I think that I, I, I just don't think that you could convince me of that. Not anytime soon. <laughs> what about if there's a act that passed Congress that's a $800 billion stimulus specifically for solar companies? Well, yeah, I would, I would trade that for a trade and then get out because it'll, you know, after that money is gone, <laughs> the same problem would, would happen. So, okay, I, I will give you that. But I would only be for a trade. But really, um, you know, I, it's a nice idea. I mean, you know, you're seeing this across, you know, you can look at like a company like F-Cell, hydrogen fuel cells. I mean, you would think that with all the R&D and that uh, 
in that realm right now that, you know, that stock would be taken off, you know, and it just hasn't. So, I mean, a lot of these ESG stocks are just not, um, they're just not getting off the ground right now. And I can't find a compelling reason to, uh, to get into uh, that area unless I really saw a big change in the technology. Yeah. Well, the, the incentives in the sort of the green sector to make, uh, very rosy promises about what technology can do. Uh, they re- they the stock is rewarded, and you know it's not like people go to jail for for like lying like saying <laughs> the company can do X and really it only does Y. Um, True. So yeah, I mean, but that's why we see these big squeezes in those markets, right? You see, you know, if you look at a chart of F cell, it's like going up and you know you have a huge squeeze and then they call you know come back down. Even in a market like TAN, which is the solar ETF, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, the, uh, the borrow fees, if you want to short those stocks, is very high, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Tracy, it's been great having you on Forward Guidance. Um, thank you so much. Is there, uh, you know, people can let, uh, find you on Twitter at Chai Girl. And of course, your, your great research on energy and materials at Hedge Fund Telemetry. Tracy, I've got a question. What does Chai Girl stand for? Uh, Chica- Chicago Girl. Uh, when, uh, I first, okay. when I first started, I was living in Chicago, obviously working at um, CBOT. But when I first started my my Twitter account, you know, I kind of just wanted it kind of a non, right? And I was just looking for news and to like, you know, follow kind of other traders and, and things like that, but not really announce myself. And then um, my account just grew. So um, and then I was stuck yeah. with the name Shy Girl. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Tracy, thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to, would love to have you back sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you. 